Now, Timothy Freak and Peter Gandy, they write, the traditional history of Christianity is hopelessly inadequate to the facts. From our research into ancient spirituality, it has become obvious that we must fundamentally revise our understanding of Christian origins in the most shocking of ways. Our conclusion, supported by a considerable body of evidence in our book, The Jesus Mysteries, is that Christianity was not a new religion. It was a continuation of paganism by another name. The gospel story of Jesus is not the biography of a historical messiah. It is a Jewish reworking of ancient pagan myths of the dying and resurrecting God-man Osiris Dionysus, which had been popular for centuries throughout the ancient Mediterranean. There you have it. So let it be known again. In order to have ancient mysteries revealed, in order to make sense of our world, it's going to be something of a painful experience. Revelatory and above all, healthy. But it's the, as all nurses know, when you want to rip a plaster off a wound, the quickest way is the short, sharp, shriek method. But we're going to need that in order to extrapolate some of the incredible mysteries by which we have been dumbed down for years. And to come to sanity is a two-fold path. You can't get to the light without first noticing the darkness. You have to do your house cleaning first. You can't just say to the garbage in your backyard, garbage be gone. You can't just uh, have a room aired by screaming from the window to let the air come in. You have to do some homework. You've got to get into the garden, get onto your knees and weed out that garden before new flowers will grow and the birds and bees will come in to create a new and beautiful uh, garden. But the, what we're talking about here is the intellectual uh, homework that needs to now be done so that we can have sanity back on its throne. Thomas Jefferson said, I have examined all the known superstitions of the world and I do not find in our particular superstition of Christianity one redeeming feature. They are all alike founded on fables and mythology. Millions of innocent men, women and children since the introduction of Christianity have been burned, tortured, fined and imprisoned. What has been the effect of this coercion to make one half of the world fools and the other half hypocrites? to support roguery and error all over the earth. The historian Strabo in ancient times wrote, it is impossible to govern a mob of women or the whole mixed multitude by philosophical reason and to exhort them to piety, holiness and faith. We must also employ superstition with its fables and prodigies. From the thunder, the abyss, the trident, the torches, the serpents, the thrissy of the gods are fables. As is all ancient theology, but the legislator introduces these things as bugbears to those who are children in understanding. That's my whole point. Children in understanding. Okay, let's accept it. Let's admit it. We are infantile in our understanding psychologically, theocratically, mystically, spiritually. Let's accept that. A child can grow. It's not the end of the world. A child can grow up and mature, but in order to mature we have to put away the childish things. Now. Collectively speaking, this is imminent. This absolutely must happen. There are no two ways. If we are to inherit any kind of future that is worth the living. One of America's greatest scholars in any sense of the word, and particularly in uh, astrotheological studies, was the mighty uh, researcher and writer Alvin, Board, Alvin Boyd Kuhn. And he wrote, that the supreme charge against Christianity is that it has caused the obsession of untold millions of minds with a series of fatuous beliefs which have motivated centuries of human actions perpetrating a body of follies, fanaticisms, cruelties and inhumanities unmatched in all history. And the instructive difference between Christianity and, let's say, Greek philosophy is now seen in startling clarity as the difference between surrender of the mind in Christianity to a series of wild and chimerical fancies in no wise based on any correspondence with truth and reality. While Greek philosophy was a system of intellectual propositions based on a complete harmonization with the known realities, the forces and elements of man's constitution and the laws of the cosmos. So Kuhn is saying, look, we're not against the fact that you have um, mythologies, fables and legends, let's have them, but can they at least be rooted in the real? Can they at least be articulated as some kind of sanity? In a book called Revelations of the Antichrist, we read, Those initiated into the sacred mysteries knew the gospel stories were false, but considered it necessary to keep up the imposition for the purposes of propagandism. 
But while this transition of faith was going on, some of the more conscientious teachers began to tell the people that the Jesus Christ they were worshipping was not a historical personage. This was regarded by the conservative priests as a dangerous disclosure, and so John denounces the innovators as liars and antichrists, knowing that he himself and his fellow priests were the pious liars, and that the antichrists were telling the truth. Error prevailed, and the mythical Christ became the historical Jesus. Now, Burton L. Mack, in his book, Who Wrote the New Testament, says, The writings in the New Testament were not written by eyewitnesses of an overpowering divine presence in the midst of human history. The Christian Bible turns out to be a masterpiece of invention. To be quite frank about it, the Bible is the product of a very energetic and successful myth-making on the part of those early Christians. And Tony Bushby, in his Bible fraud, he says, It is important to remember that the words authorized and original as applied to the Bible do not mean genuine, authentic, or true. Now the Egyptians, unlike us today, did not open their year at uh, December 21st or January 1st, or even where astrologers are wont to think of the beginning of the zodiac, which is Aries. No, their year opened in the sign of Virgo, which in those days, because of processional movement of the heavens, was around July 20th, 25th, is when the Nile started to rise and the flood waters began to rise. That was around about the period uh, when Sirius, the star, was high in the sky around the July 20th and 25th, uh, the season, and that was the, s the sun would rise into the constellation or sign of Virgo. And a Virgo is, of course, the sign of the Virgin, which has always been depicted for ancient, ancient times as the female, the female goddess or the female queen, the beautiful Virgin, Virgo. Well, of course, naturally, if the year for the Egyptians opened in Virgo, then like ours, we have 12 seasons, 12 months to go through until the year closes. And the year will close, logically, in the sign before Virgo. And the sign before uh, Virgo, just pick up a coffee table book on astrology or log, log onto the internet and look up, and you'll see that the sign that comes before Virgo is Leo the Lion. Leo the Lion was then the closing of the year. So that is why you have a Sphinx, because it is the head of the Virgin and the tail of a lion, meaning in one symbol, and this is the way the ancients did things, so beautifully, so figuratively. The idea is that the head of the female looks out to the horizon, her gaze follows the whole earth, which is circular, and comes back to the body of the lion. It is simply a symbol of the zodiac. It's a symbol of the zodiac in sandstone, standing 66 feet high. And all it is to tell you is that we were astrologers. We were the Magi. So the first sign of the zodiac Virgo, a sign of the Virgin. The last sign of the zodiac, Leo. Put them together and you've got the Sphinx. Virgo was the female, the Virgin, holding the sheaf of wheat. Now the sun entered the sign of Virgo around July 25th. Upon entering this female sign, the ancient cosmologist said that the sun, that's the Son of God, the heavens was born again, born of a virgin. That's where that term comes from, the Christian idea of being born of a virgin, one of the meanings of it, there are many, but in the stellar cult, it was the idea that the Son of God was now being born in the sign of the virgin, or of a virgin. When the Sphinx was constructed, its visage even faced that part of the horizon where the constellations of Leo and Virgo rose at nightfall. So this face, the eyes were looking to the horizon but at night, Virgo and Leo would rise right in front of the eyes of the Sphinx. Now, because the beginning of this zodiacal belt was in Virgo, the zodiac was called the Girdle of Isis, the Virgin Goddess. She was the prototype of Mary. The son of Isis was Horus. Mary's son was Jesus. Horus was the basis of the Christ myth. His name meant light or sun. And that's where we get the word horizon or the zone of Horus. And we also get hours from his name. And that's right. Horus's zone, that's the zone of the sun, when the sun rises on the horizon, it's the zone of Horus, the sun god, the horizon. The old word for prayers in the Shakespearean era was horizons, and we all know that we turn to the east. Cultures still do this. You turn to the east to say your prayers, your horizons. Why do you turn to the east? Because the sun is going to rise there. You worship the sun. It's a solar cult. And Horus, you just have to turn two of the letters around and you get Hours, H-O-U-R-S, because they used to say, to take the time, where is Horus now? 
where is the golden falcon now? Meaning, what hour of the day is it? What Horus of the day is it? We even tell our children to be as good as gold, meaning be as good as the golden one, Horus. You are a youngster. A child is known as a young star. Like Horus was the youngster of Isis and Osiris. So just remember, when you hear that term, born of a virgin, think astrology. But again, we're being told this. You only have to look at the symbolism. Once you've opened your right brain, you're using your whole mind, you've learned some pattern recognition, you'll find that nothing's been concealed from you. Mother Mary with a sun above her head and the crescent moon under her feet. We have it in the corporate logos of today, Columbia Pictures. The Virgin with the sun gleaming behind her back or the, holding the great uh, torch. Literally, the sun in Virgo. What you're seeing in that logo is nothing more than an astrological motif. The original Madonna, born of a virgin. The solar cult get hold of this and they move things around. Uh, Horus suddenly becomes more aligned with the sun, yes, but more aligned with, say, Aries. Jesus holding the Lamb of God. Everyone knows the Lamb or the Ram is the, sun, the sign of Aries. So they move the Son of God away from Virgo and move it to a new place, a new identification. And that can be okay to do in some respects, but it's what the mythographers do every age. They change the symbolism. Once upon a time, the bull was worshipped and the cow goddess. That represents Taurus, the bull. Later on, the ram. Egypt's filled with the ram symbols because that's Aries. As the sun moves, the mythology has changed. So the pyramid and the sphinx and many of the other tombs and temples, structures, are patently astronomical and astrological. And even when you render or see the Sphinx rendered, you'll notice that it also has wings, or it might have claws, or it might have scales. It has the head of a woman, it has the tail of a dragon or a lion. Again, that just represents the four corners, the, the four coming together, the wings and the claws and the body of a lion, the cardinal points of the zodiac. Not only is the Bible the center of Judeo-Christianity, but of course we have the cross, the crucifix, the story of Calvary. Well, Madame Helena Blavatsky says the crucifix was an instrument of torture and utterly common among Romans as it was unknown among Semitic nations. It is certainly not the Christian cross that John had in mind when speaking of the signet of the living God. That's right, it wasn't the cross of Calvary, of torture that John had in mind. We're going to find out what cross he had in mind when he was thinking of symbolizing Christianity. Tony Bushby says of it, the symbol of the cross originated as part of an ancient Egyptian initiatory rite and eventually found its way into Christianity. The church stated that in its history there is no proof of the use of the cross until much later than the 6th century. It is recorded in Christian archives that the general use of the crucifix was ratified at the 6th Ecumenical Council in 680 AD. The council decreed that the figure of a man fastened to a cross now be adopted, and the new church logo was later confirmed by Emperor Hadrian I. About a century later, the first pictures of Jesus Christ standing against a cross slowly start to appear. So we're talking about seven, eight hundred years after the rise of Christianity, uh, the cross suddenly becomes the central motif. Bishop Kaleno, he said that of the several varieties of cross still in vogue as national and ecclesiastical emblems, there is not amongst them the existence of which may not be traced to the remotest antiquity. They were the common property of the Eastern nations. So there's nothing uh, unique about the cross in Christianity. Tony Bushby in his Bible fraud, he says, there was no verification of a landmark or significant crucifixion of a person called Jesus Christ in the writings of such highly regarded contemporary historians as Philo, Tacitus, Pliny, Suetonius, Epictetus, uh, Cluvius, Rufus, Quintus, Curtus Rufus, Josephus, Plutarch, and the Roman consul Plubius Petronius. None, no mention. Stephen Knapp, in his book, Proofs of a Vedic Culture's Global Existence, he says, it was not until the Sixth Synod of Constantinople that it was decided that the symbol of Christianity would be represented from that time on as a man crucified on a cross. In fact, the earliest instances of any artwork that illustrates Jesus on a cross can be traced back um, only to the 8th or 9th century. 
So how biographical is that? That they have to wait 800 years before they go, oh, let's use a cross. But of course, the ancient world knew all about it and have been using it for generations. Its origin, again, is the zodiac. We have two phenomena, two other cycles of importance in the heavens, which, without which you couldn't have astrology or astronomy, and these are known as the ecliptic and the celestial equator. There is a trajectory of the sun around the earth. Okay, we mentioned that. There is the trajectory of the sun around the earth. That is a band of about 17 degrees wide, on which are the major constellations. That is the zodiac. Now this belt itself crosses another belt called the celestial equator. When the sun annually reaches the junction point of this, of this cross, we have the spring and autumn equinoxes. In the year, when you cross the ecliptic and the celestial equator, those two joins is where we have, when the sun reaches them, that is, we have the spring and autumn equinoxes. So as the sun approaches those two junctions, as you can see in that diagram there, at the place where the two belts cross, you have the solstices and the equinoxes. And of course, there's two of each making four. There's a better picture of it. The vernal equinox facing the autumnal equinox, the summer solstice facing the winter solstice. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the original cross that John was talking about as the symbol of Christianity because he understood that the 12 disciples, Jesus representing the sun from the nativity onwards, this was all about the solar cult. And he wanted the symbol of the cross to represent the zodiacal cross, the great cross of the zodiac. How many flags do you know? How many flags do you know in the world that contain that cross? Here is a St. George's cross. What you're actually seeing there is a minute part of these two cycles. Those two lines or those two bars look very straight, don't they? But if you were to project them out and think of them actually as two circles, and the point of crossing is the crossing of those two circles, now you will understand why the flags of the world were chosen with stars and motifs on them, and why this peculiar symbol of the cross is found. It represents that very coming together, but of course they're focusing in on it, of the crossing point of the ecliptic and the equator. So when you hear the Christians uh, chanting and talking about following Christ to the cross, just realize what cross it is. Now Joseph A. Seiss in his Gospel of the Star says, In the triad of the three great Egyptian gods, each holds a sacred Tau or the cross as the symbol of life and immortality. So the fourfold cross is seen here on Ta, the ancient god of the Egyptians. And when you hear of Jesus dying on the cross, realize that it's the cross of winter upon which he is dying to be reborn again after three days. Luke 23. Now when the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God, saying, Certainly this man was innocent. Centurion is a coded message. It refers to Ares, the warrior. When the Ares, as the sun is dying, the centurion sees what is happening. He understands that God is dying, but that he's innocent. The entombment of Jesus into the... Uh, cave or into the uh, tomb is also referring to the southern signs. When the sun falls into the dark signs of winter, it's just a symbol of entombment. You find this in the story of Lazarus. You find this in the story of uh, Osiris and all the Christ saviors of the world go into the dark place for a sojourn from which they will rise again. And on the third day I shall rise again, said the Christ. The third day can be looked at as the three signs from Capricorn to Aries. The three signs from the depth of winter to the spring, okay? Capricorn, Aquarius, Pisces. We're thinking of three days, three seasons, three periods of time. Now we know the birth of Jesus we've looked at, but we also hear a very specific detail. Christ dies at age 33. Well, the answer to that is again concerning the procession of the equinoxes. The sun passes backward through the zodiac, remember, and moves through each of the 30 degrees in approximately one month of 30 days. So, on a daily routine, it takes 30 days to move through one sign. It comes into a sign at the first degree and is completely out of the sign by the 33rd degree. That is why Jesus, the Son of God, was said to have died at 33. It is also why there are 33 degrees within masonry. 
Freemasons are the descendants of the stellar cult. So we have Jesus, our Father who heart in heaven, referring himself to the sun, to Venus, to the morning star. The sun is three degrees in the sky, a sign is 30 degrees. In order to move 30 degrees, but to completely leave it, it's about 33 degrees. Again, if we turn to the Bible, we see the connections there. In Revelation 22, Jesus is saying in his own words, I am the root and offspring of David and the bright and morning star. I'm the bright and morning star. You can't worship it. You can't mention it. You can't practice astrology. That's all meant to be you know, taboo and evil and satanic. But it's okay for Jesus to say, I'm, I'm, I'm identifying myself with the heavens, with the stars. Everyone knows the morning star is Venus or the sun. Jesus of Nazareth. There was no locale called Nazareth. The word derives from the Egyptian Nazir, meaning the prince who is sent, and also from Nasir, meaning Sirius. That's a star, the star Sirius. So therefore it is Jesus of Nasirius. Furthermore, the word carpenter, you always hear about Jesus being a carpenter. This again is um, cryptic language. This is cipher language. The word carpenter comes from the word Nagar, which means the serpent priests. Freemasons, even to this day, will use uh, cover euphemisms like this. And instead of saying Mason, they may say the word carpenter. But everyone in the know knows what that means. Let us understand also that when the sun god falls, he falls into the female signs. And although the Christians did uh, a lot of heavy duty work to denigrate that, the idea was that the son is born in the virgin and he dies and goes back to the virgin, to the mother. That is the night sky. Forever he is encompassed in the body of the womb of the night sky. So at this stage of our program, it is not outside the bounds of reason, after what we've been uh, showing, that we have to understand that the Gospels are not a biography. The Bible was and is nothing more, nothing less than an astro-theological story, a sidereal myth. I believe that the writers of the Bible knew that. They had no intention of ever presenting it at anything else. And they would have been astounded that modern generations would actually think that it was a biography. Because if you were actually trying to create a biography, you would have done a much better job than the one that we have coming down to us. Even with all the machinations and throwing away and burning of other books, you still would have made it look more officially like a biography if that had been your intention. But the allegorists of the ancient world knew that everyone knows that this is a fable, a story. They would have not been able to even comprehend how this literally would have been taken so literally. And that the real, pure, beautiful, intriguing and mysterious meaning of it would just have been thrown out with the trash. This can be confirmed because if one substitutes the words zodiac and constellations for the following terms, the scriptures will begin to reveal their secret meanings. What terms? You can take a lot of them. Tabernacle, New Jerusalem, Nazareth, Bethlehem, Hall of Judges, Kingdom of God, Tent of God, Flocks by Night, Aeons or Ages, Seasons, Oracles, Citadel. We have the seven churches, the Mount of Olives, Mount of Glory, City of David, Celestial City, Heaven, Throne of the Elect, Abode of the Most High, the Labyrinth, the Most Holy Place, Mercy Seat. Whenever you uh, meet or encounter these uh, strange, cryptic, uh, untranslatable terms in the Bible. Just in your mind, substitute the word constellations or zodiac and see what happens. You might be amazed. Now the dramatis personae of the Old Testament are not biographical characters. Abraham, Jacob, Moses, Solomon, David, Samson, Joseph, Daniel, Jesus, and all the other patriarchs originally symbolized alignments and conjunctions between the planets and the luminaries. Their many wives, their sons and daughters simply represent degrees and minutes of zodiacal arc. So God is the sun. But Samson was the sun. In fact, the word Shamash, Samson in Hebrew, Shamash means the sun. It's so literal. Daniel in the lion's den, fighting the lions or being saved from the lion. The whole idea is Leo based at the sun of God is passing through the trials of the sign of Leo. Because like Hercules, you go through the 12 signs if you're the hero. Now the word of God, we find that in the Bible, the very word we use, Amen, Amen, at the end of a prayer, we say Amen. 
Amen is literally Amen Ra of the Egyptian pantheon. The god of the Hebrews is Adonai. But that comes from the sun god Aton. The T becomes a D. In the Egyptian, there is the prayer that opens Amon Amon, who art in heaven, in Egyptian. Lazarus comes from the Egyptian La Asuras. Asura is the Indian Surya, which to this day means the sun. But Asurya was actually the old name of Osiris. They didn't pronounce it Osiris. They called him Asurya, the sun. The Indians have Surya, the sun. Lazarus, coming out of the dark tomb, wrapped as a mummy. Christ said he's only sleeping. He'll come forth as a sleepwalker. It's Osiris, coming out of the underworld, coming out of the tomb, being born again. The Son of God, as the sun above us in the heavens. Jordan Maxwell, in Ancient Belief System, says, if one also replaces the word sun, S-O-N, with the word sun, S-U-N, wherever the former is found in the Bible, it will be discovered that every single verse fits the literal sun and not a man. In fact, the verses make better sense. That's right. Every time you see the word Son of God or the word Jesus, just in your mind, put there the word S-U-N and think of the sun and suddenly the Bible will come alive and every passage not only fits but makes better sense than if it was a biography. And that is how the mythographers who've painted the image of Jesus are showing you the rays of the sun, the red cross of the equinox, standing on the clouds, haloed with the sun and the cross of the zodiac, the light of the world. Behold, he cometh with clouds, says Revelation 1. Yes, the sun does come with clouds. The Christians to this day in the churches raise their arms and the old symbol of the Ka. Open any book on Egyptian mythology and look and you'll see the gods raising their arms and that is known as the Ka, the K-A. When you raise your arms like that to symbolize the soul. But just on the most primitive level, just observe the artwork. Just look at the imagery that is being shown to you. The Christ haloed with light, our Father who art in heaven. We end our prayers with Amen, which literally meant the Son God. The words of Jesus in Revelation 22, I am the root and offspring of David and the bright and morning star. Jesus at 12 years old is referred to as the Most High. In the Bible, he's referred to as the Most High. Well, the sun at the noon position of 12 o'clock is the original Most High. As we said, Christ comes from the Egyptian karast, meaning made flesh. All right, so the word is ancient. It comes from the word karast, meaning to be made flesh. It also means as a secondary meaning to be anointed with oil. The Christ is to be the oiled one or the uh, baptized one. Now in the story of Jesus, we have of course the famous motif of the birthday of Jesus. It's well brought out. It's a famous story, nativity, that the Son of God is a historical personage. They try to tell us and that he has a birthday, the nativity. From Fraser, we find that the custom of celebrating Christ's birth began in Egypt, being derived from the mother goddess cult there, and the Christians there celebrated it on 6th of January. Okay, so the original date of birth of the Sun God from ancient times was January 6th. By the 4th century, it had become generally established in the East. The Western Church had never recognized the 6th of January as the true date, and in time, its decision was accepted by the Eastern Church. At Antioch, this change was not introduced until 375 AD. Now, the reason why the Fathers transferred the celebration of the 6th of January to the 25th of December was this. It was the custom of the heathen to celebrate on the same 25th of December the birthday of the sun at which they kindled lights in token of festivity. In these solemnities and festivities, the Christians also took part. Accordingly, when the doctors of the church perceived that the Christians had a leaning to this festival, they took counsel and resolved that the true nativity should be solemnized on that day and the festival of the Epiphany on the 6th of January. Accordingly, 
along with this custom, the practice has prevailed, the kindling of fires until the 6th. Alexander Del Mar in his fine book, Middle Ages Revisited, says, Sir Isaac Newton in his Prophecies of Daniel showed that not only the solar festivals, but all the other principal ones observed by the early church were Roman festivals fitted with new names. There's nothing holy about the Holy Roman Empire. There's nothing holy about Constantine. And sadly, there's nothing holy about modern Christianity that came right out of that. Now, Melito of Sardis, the second century theologian, said that King of Heaven, Prince of Creation, Son of the Eastern Sky, who appeared both to the dead in Hades and to the mortals upon earth, he, the only true Helios, arose for us out of the highest summits of heaven. So wait a minute, I thought that Jesus rose out of the highest summits of heaven. No, Helios did, the King of Heaven, the Son. Tony Bushby uh, says that the Emperor then instructed the Bishop Eusebius to compile a uniform collection of new writings to be bound together as one. Eusebius was to arrange for the production of a 50 sumptuous copies to be written on parchment in a legible manner and in a convenient portable form by professional scribes thoroughly accomplished in their art. Make them to astonish, said Emperor Constantine. This was the first mention of finished copies of the Christian New Testament in the history of mankind. With the, his instructions now fulfilled, Emperor Constantine decreed that the new writings be thereafter called the words of God and be attached to copies of the Hebrew Old Testament. Emperor Vespasian in the first century had proclaimed the entire Jewish territory the personal property of the Roman emperors and his decision was officially ratified by the Senate. In effect, all later emperors were in control of the Jewish religion. Emperor Constantine effectively attempted to amalgamate the earlier Jewish religion with his new cult. By legal inheritance, he was also the Messiah. After Eusebius had finished drawing upon the large array of Presbyter's texts, Constantine then ordered them to be destroyed by fire, and any man found concealing one should be stricken off um, his shoulders, that is, beheaded. Tony Bushby goes on to say, It is important to note that the format of the name Jesus Christ was not cemented down until the time of the Reformation. That is the 14th and 17th centuries A.D. For in earlier times it had several renditions, such as Yeshua Christ or Yeshua Christos. Alvin Boyd Kuhn says, A study of Christian history discloses the portentous fact that the concept of the malignancy of matter coming into the movement of Hinduism through Zoroastrianism became an influence overwhelmingly dominating the theology and the ethic. It bred the monstrous cult of asceticism whose driving motivation was the idea that the instincts of the flesh must be crushed down in the interests of the spirit. The tragic consequence of this staggering default of insight are incalculable, but in all conscience overwhelming to any intelligence that discerns it. It lay the Christian mind open to the obsession of a psychological influence that has been nothing less than devastating to sanity, inflicting upon the psyche a trauma that has produced morbidity and crushed to a degree the natural instincts for human happiness. But that's what this whole blitzkrieg on the human psyche was meant to do, to suppress the feminine, to alienate you from the earth, to think that God is up in the cloud somewhere and he's also wrathful, he's also an all stern, father figure who's judging your every move to get you to be so schizoid, pathological and uh, existentially dreamt that you wouldn't even be able to fashion your own destiny and your own thoughts.